Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, uh, thank you for inviting me into your world. It's an extraordinary place. I had to ask my friend here what an MK was. <laughs> I, I, re I remembered what a skittle was, but I had to dredge that up. But um, now I know you can get skittles in an MK, and so I, I, feel, I feel somewhat reassured. In fact, reassurance is important. I, I, I really believe that we need to um, be able to talk about this without fear. And so I'm here in front of all these lights. Um, I know there's dazzling, beautiful young people out there, but I can't see any of you. So it's OK. So if I'm smiling vaguely at you, it's nothing creepy, OK? Uh, it's just I can't see you. Okay. I want you to know that I'm here because I'm the last speaker, and they asked me to be very short, OK? So you could all get back to your email. So I'm saying, no, I'm going to be a little bit revolutionary and save you from your email. I've just come from a really great event, the Aviva, a world sort of, I suppose, is it a Google event of that scale? But certainly a national event, um, Ireland's largest um, mental health summit. And uh, so I'm a, a bit hoarse. We've all been shouting and talking, and I did my gig. And uh, it's an attempt to bring everybody together. And I think that's what you're doing here. You're coming together. And that's why it's why kind of interesting, because there's all these lovely seats empty here. <laughs> so it's Google, but it's still human. Everybody's hiding at the back, you know what I mean? Some things don't change, but some things do. And one of the things that's changing is our willingness to come and talk about mental health. So it's really great that you're here, and it's really a thrill for me. I'm fascinated by your place. Well, look, the practical approach that I want to talk to you about I want to key into two areas, because there's loads of things I'd love to tell you about. But resilience is one of them. Now, resilience is not what other people think about it. You know, resilience has become a thing that uh, people blame people about. Oh, you weren't resilient enough, OK? You need to be more resilient to work here, you know? Those of us who don't have an MK with a Skittle, you know, we'll know about that. <laughs> but that's not resilience, OK? So I want to talk a bit about that. And coping skills. Well, you know, in my world, coping is a really bad word. But actually, in the real world, people want to cope. I want to be able to overcome, and I want to have skills to do it. And it turns out that's actually very true. Psychologically, we can learn and continue to learn to get better at doing this thing, which is staying well. So of course, we could abandon the talk now. And instead of Skittles, we could just have Huitos, OK? I mean, why wouldn't we? I, I talked at 9 o'clock this morning in the Viva, so breakfast was very much in my mind. So I brought the breakfast cereal and the image of it. Since that morning, I had had a bowl of Wheatos. And look what it did for me. It gave me strength. <laughs> I feel fantastic. It gave me alertness. My goodness. It gave me energy. It kept me on my game. It's a bowl of Wheatos, for God's sake, OK? But if it's as this simple as this, let's, let's just all do it. Maybe we should have this in the MK. Maybe you do. <laughs> I don't know. But one of the things we've started to learn about talking about mental health and about overcoming challenge of stigma is that you know some of the things we say are a little bit shallow, a little bit fatuous. You know, it's good to talk. You know, we just need to get out there and talk. OK? There is no stigma if we all talk. Well, you know. It's not quite as simple as that. Our desire to give simplistic messages is somewhat selling us short, OK? We're actually bright people. You're the brightest of your generation. That's why you've got the MK, OK? You know? <laughs> Look, it's a trade. You know, there's no question about it. You know? <laughs> so you're here for a reason, OK? And the reason is you're bright. I reckon you're able for a complex message, something that's not exactly just a huito, OK? I reckon it's time for that. And I reckon we know that there's no single step to building better mental health. There is no single step. But hold a minute, I'm getting a little bit harder to, 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 to figure out this. I'm just wondering, you know, I mean, the nice compare said, you know, you know, who was you know, talking back in sevens? Wasn't that? It was a bit hard, wasn't it? Very hard, OK? So I'm going to go for threes, OK? It's a three, not a single message, not one wheato, but three. Well, it's not me. Freud said it. He was a big dude, OK? Big dude. <laughs> big Google dude, OK? Google him. Great. And what did he say? He said, living, working, and loving. That's what's health. Now, how many of us can do all the living and the working and the loving? The nice lady at the back 
you know, was talking about, you know, there's the, there's the three-month-old and the, the, the six-month-old and the four-year-old, you know, and, and we're all trying to get some sleep. It's very, very hard. But we don't do them all at the same time. We don't do them all so fully. But they're not one single thing. Humanity, human life, our existence is valued because it's rich and complex and varied. Okay? It's living, working, and loving. Now, how do we translate that to something we can actually do something? Now, I, I, I try and write mental health books, or health books, or indeed just books, okay? And they don't sell. <laughs> now, everybody say, ah. ah. He writes books that don't sell. But that's okay. One of them's going to sell. One of them's going to sell. So recently, I've been writing a new book, and I give it to all my friends and give it to my, lots of my patients, and they send me back, one, my good friend John sent me back the book the other day and said, I feel, Jim, you've shortchanged me in this book, you know, and that's saying something since you gave it to me for nothing. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean? He said, I want to know where you stand. What does all this add? This diet, this exercise, this sleep, all this stuff, all these resilience, what does it come to? What's your summation of it? And I said, well, there's no single way. No, no, don't give me that. I can take some complexity. But I need some synthesis. What does it come to? And I said, well, it's living, working, and loving. He said, but that book's already sold. <laughs> you didn't write that. You need to do something. And so I want to talk to you about planning. I want to talk to you about processing. And I think want to talk to you about relating. Well, we all have stress. And you need to know that stress is not an evil. Indeed, it's an essential. If you were in a laboratory and working sort of, you know, Trinity or whatever, it's where I, wherever I work, you'd find them raising stressed young animals and then raising non-stressed young animals. And you know which ones do better? Which ones do better? The stressed young animals do far better. Far better. Stress is actually something that is universal. Remove it from your life and actually it's not a better life. Okay. Distress is also universal. The stressed animals, of course, cope with distress far better, which is interesting. But each one of us here will have a moment, a time, a period of our life where we are distressed. And that's fine. Actually, that's not a catastrophe. It's a good thing. It's a sort of a pyramid. Everybody can be stressed. At some time, some of us are distressed. And then, at the top, some of us are ill. Now, that's not you or me or anybody else. No, it's, yes, it is. It's all of us. So each one of us has somebody in their family. Well, let me try this. Supposing you were to try this, ask yourself this question. Is there somebody that I love, somebody in my family, that is currently mentally ill? And if there is, will you write your, raise your right hand with me? There you go. For those who can't see, who haven't been able to occupy the front seats, the reality is every hand in the room went up. So this mental health issue is about my brother, your sister, my wife, your daughter. It's not about other people. It's about us. And so it's a really a powerful thing. One in four of us will have a mental health illness in our lifetime. One in five, it'll be depression. Okay? Depression is the commonest cause of disability in the Western world. It's now outstripped infectious diseases. And before you're 50, it is the commonest cause of death, far outstripping any other illness. Two people die of it every day in this country. So it's not a small issue. It's not somebody else's issue. So is it an issue to talk about at all? Well, it is, because we need to know that we can be resilient. As human beings, we're naturally resilient. It may be that we have to take stock, but the success of humanity has been about its capacity to adapt, to change, to be resilient. And part of that has been our capacity to capture the story of our lives and to capture it in a way which gives meaning to it. This is something that we, means, makes us able to come together as a team and work together. Google isn't an industry, it's a story. You're not here at a job. You're working together as a team with meaning. And it seems to me that that's why you've got MK and Skittles. 
So what I'm saying to you is the ability to bounce back involves you and me as individuals and our collective as society. So what we need to do in mental health is address both, speak about both. When somebody knocks on your door and asks your vote and they say, I'm for mental health, don't just look at their green ribbon on their, on their lapel. Ask them, what are they doing? And ask it, why is it the case that in Ireland our allocation of spend for health spend, for mental health spend, is so low? It's really low, okay? It's, it's considerably lower than the best, the best. And it's lower than our comparable cities in the Western world. And the reason is because we've been gotten away, we've been sold a pup. We need to invest in this collectively. And we need to invest in ways which will make us resilient. Now, what are those ways? Are they some kind of magic potions that don't exist except in dreams or in books? Okay, no. Turns out that the things that make us resilient are very human and very attractive and very, well, look at them. This is a slide taken from Barnardo's. No slide I'm going to give you has come from anywhere but the Google I looked at. But this one is the summation of the life's work of a great man called Michael Rutter. So one of the things I want you to do is imagine you're uh, in Trinity and I'm teaching you and I've asked you all to turn off your mobile phones and uh, listen to me. And then you're medical students, so you don't listen to me. <laughs> and in fact, I've now stopped asking. I said, no, turn on your mobile, mobile phones. And you call up this image. So now I don't use PowerPoints like this anymore. Everybody just turns on their phone. They'll take them out. They'll look at them. Okay? And they can take them home. This is a summation, this image, of a lifetime's work of a great man called Michael Rutter. He's an elderly man now, but when I was at the Institute of Psychiatry in London, he was there over in the corner. We were in awe of him, absolute awe of him. As a young boy, he'd been evacuated to get away from the Blitz. The children of England and Wales had to be removed from the dangers of, of the bombings. He was to be sent to New York. He had relatives there. And so he was put in a transporter ship and moved across the Atlantic. Imagine it, 1942. What was going on in 1942 in the Atlantic at the time? The U-boat war. It was a dreadful, dreadful experience. So as a young boy, he noticed this extreme distress, separated from his family, in peril at the sea, and in the middle of a battle. And only half of the kids were weeping. Yes, half were, but the other half were not. And why was that? It stuck in his mind. It stuck in his mind. He came up with a concept of resilience. Something made some of those kids resilient. After the war, a corruption of the work of Freud and Bowlby said that really it's about mothers. No. So for a long time we've blamed mothers for everything, okay? And uh, so we blamed the mothers, and we said the mothers are making these children not resilient because they're at work, so they need to go home, okay? All right? And so uh, they cleared the industrial space that had been filled by working women while the men were at war and told all the women to go home. And Rutter said, no, this isn't right. There's something wrong here. Resilience is about something complex. What is it? And so he and a whole raft of people spent a lifetime studying it, and if you get 20 minutes, Google the Life Scientific on BBC4 and listen to, this, to his interview. It's wonderful. Because I've shortened a lifetime's work, or looked at Barnardo's have, into this one slide. Okay, education. Turns out education really makes you strong, makes you able to bounce back. And continuous learning is something that you're really about. You're giving the modern vehicle for learning. I've told you, I've suspended some of the ways I've been teaching and lecturing for decades because of the technology you're bringing and the opportunity it has. A secure base. It's really resilient to have somewhere in your heart, in your life, in your origins, a security of base. Last night, over 10,000 people slept in the streets in the city, and they have no secure base, and their future is hugely damaged. In the immediate context, they're in jeopardy. But in the long term, their 6,000 children and themselves are being injured in a mental health way that will reap the whirlwind. It is a scandal. But it is also a folly. 
because we're just creating mental health challenge that we need to address, we need to invest in. Social competencies. You see, I kind of want to come back to the MK. I'm told that you know, no Google office is more than 150 paces from a kitchen. Okay, That's not because they just want you to eat all the time. They want you to be social. They want you to connect. And we don't really do that. You know? In our country, in our culture, we're actually quite shy. You know, I'm very shy. I can do this, but you know, talk to me one to one and I don't really know what to say. You going for a pint? You know? Did you go to the match? You know? How did man you do? Okay. But if you're in a country or a state where there is a greater social competency, you notice it. You get a plane to Paris, you get off the plane and you see them going, muh, 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 muh. <laughs> and what's that all about? Okay. You know, I, I think if you hang in for a little more, would it be a bit odd? You know, would it be a bit creepy? No. <laughs> Possibly would. You just wouldn't know. There is an embrace that's possible in a socially competent sense, but we're really in jeopardy now. We don't know what we do, how we greet. Do we shout cans? Do we say hi? Do we lean in? Do we lean out? Nobody knows now. We're in jeopardy here, and it's not actually a good thing, but we need to build social competency. And I suspect that's the great inventors of the Google, Google enterprise understood this very well. <laughs> Friendships. Friendships are hugely important. I'm 60 next birthday. In the last five years, I've lost five of my greatest friends, and I'm conscious of that. Now, most of them, four of them, were younger than me, which is pretty challenging. One of them was 92, and I met him before Christmas. He died in January, and we used to go to lunch. We'd have a nice lunch. We'd go to chapter one. Nice. nice. <laughs> no Skittles. And you know, John, he said, John, John said to me, Jim, you know, we've been doing this for 10 years or so or more. He had once been a my teacher. He, he was once the director of the hospital. And he said, uh, but you know what, Jim? I want to tell you this. You never call me. I said, what do you mean, John? We've been having this dinner. No, he said, I always call you. And I said, but John, I always pay for lunch. <laughs> he said, no, no. I call you. I'm just giving you a gift, Jim, he said. Who do you call? Make the call. Ask yourself now, who do I call and have I called them? Will I call them? Don't just assume they're going to be the end of a Google counter or the end of your particular work stream. Make the call. Friendship is a resilient factor. Talents and interests. Well, now, you're all young and you're all so able and you've got such a career and stuff. that You probably won't resonate with this, but in my time of life, I put the word used to before my talents and interests. I used to do a lot of painting. I used to do a lot of singing. I used to play a lot of games. I used, uh, it goes on. Ask yourself how many used tos you have before the things that you're talented at and we're interested in. You used to? You used to? Take your used tos out and say, I am doing. I will do. And you change your life. Take your used tos and put them in a bin. Make them, am doing, will do. But what happens then? Yes, what happens is but. You know, I'm in the head business, but really I'm in the butt business. <laughs> Take your butt out, okay, and replace it with another word. And. I used to do that, and I'm doing it today. All of a sudden, you've got a transformed experience. Your talents and interests are not things that are history, but are things that are your story now, and positive values. Now, Google is part of a sort of a whole world. It's fantastic. It's linked up. You know, I was in there. They, they, they were giving me the Skittles and stuff, and I saw San Francisco and Hamburg and Boston or whatever it was. It was fantastic. But in this country, we've gone through an enormous cataclysm of change. Change is good. But one of the things that's happened is that every single authority, every single establishment, every single source of rectitude or knowledge or understanding or compliance has been discredited. Everyone. So in 10 years, we have re resolved this country to be in a complete position 
of not knowing. We've lost every belief. I think, apart from the GAA, every institution has been destroyed. And maybe that had to happen. But one of the problems is that positive values are not actually being extolled. Indeed, values, positive one or other, are hard to articulate in a way that is safe and understood. The difficulty is we need positive values. The evidence is overwhelming about this. It's a resilient factor. And the positive value you need most of all is a belief in you. Every day, two people die because of a loss of this faith in the value of your life. The positivity of our lives is a value we need to be able to dip into. Look at these six items. Think of them as kind of vats. Skittle pots in your MK. Dip into them. Make sure they're never depleted. Refill them. Your education, your security, your competency around social things, your friendships, your talents and interests, your positive values, they will be drained. Fill them up. Replenish each other's and be resilient. But how do we do this? Well, it's not just a question of eating your Huitos or one single solution. But there are three things we need to do. The first is we need to plan. You cannot take this for granted. It's important, especially important when you're challenged. By golly, you wish you had done it when you weren't challenged. At that point, you say, wow, what plans did I make? Planning, of course, is a process of thinking about the activities we require to do in order to achieve a desired goal. <coughs> but a goal without a wish, or a goal without a plan, is just a wish. It has to be something that is constructive. So the three fine men here who were earlier, they had tremendous stuff. I was feeling tired, I have to admit. I was feeling, my God, I can't get this eaten and dieting and all that. And they were saying, no, you relax, you've got to enjoy it. But it is tremendously agenda-driven, OK? And it needs to be. We need to plan. So we need to look at our eating. The man was saying, yes, you need to increase the color of it, and you need to increase the variety of it. And you, you know, there's a thing to do. He's absolutely right. And in fact, good eating helps us. No diet particularly makes us undepressed if we're depressed or less anxious if we're anxious. On the other hand, lots of evidence, huge evidence shows that eating better for a country, for a society, for an individual is better. The Mediterranean diet is a very good example. Lean meat, less wine, lots of olive oil, lots of those nice salad. Actually, yep, those guys who eat that stuff. They live long and happy lives. Actually, they're less depressed. But it can't, you can't just give somebody lean meat and lettuce and expect them to, to, their depression to recover. It doesn't work like that. And sleeping. You've heard talk about sleeping. Integrate it. It's absolutely true. If you were a nine-year-old in 1959, UK, you would have been getting at least, at least an hour's more sleep than a nine-year-old today. At least. And Google has something to ask about that. The flat screen world needs to say, no, don't turn me on. Go back to sleep. Imagine if your Google turned back to you and said, excuse me, I'm refusing your search. You need to go to bed. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a cool thing to do? But you get into your motor car. You get into your, your motor And it tells you to stop now. It's saying, by the way, you've been driving for three hours. You need to take a break. It's coming, folks, because we're going to need to challenge ourselves to do things that are sustaining. And sleeping is one of the most important of those things. We spend a third of our lives doing it. You know, think of it. You know, you get to 90, you'll have spent 30 years sleeping. Now, something we do that much can't be without value or purpose. In fact, it's of necessity we do it. And exercise. I'm particularly interested in the mental health, the health of people in the health industry. That's where I work. Nurses and doctors, psychologists. And we have huge health consequences for the experience of stress that we're, we're working in. However, if you were to look at populations of doctors and nurses and see the distressed, the ill, and separate those and compare them to the well and the resilient, one factor actually would divide them, and that's those who take exercise. It turns out exercise is hugely important. It's become the new religion, you know, but in reality, it actually does discriminate. It does divide the, those who are resilient from those who aren't. It's fantastic. 
For mild to moderate depressions, for example, actually exercise is as good as any medication or any other therapy. Once you get to moderate to severe, that just stops being the case. Or once you get to the stage when your knees hurt, it stops being the case. So then it's hard to do. And art is hugely important. We have a huge investment in St. Patrick's in art therapy. We've got fantastic paintings on the walls, but we spend a whole lot of time painting and sculpting and making stuff, and it's hugely beneficial. It's tremendous when somebody says, do you know, I never did this before. And they say, they discover it. The huge restorative factor of making something out of clay, of throwing that paint on a canvas. But it's equally impressive when somebody says, you know, I used to do this, but I stopped. And then, of course, there's music. Music is actually hugely restorative. I don't know how many of you are in a choir or whether we actually could form a choir. Could there be a Google choir here in Dublin? Yeah, is. is there? Well done to you. Because actually, the people in the choir are more resilient than those who aren't. They are likely to be happier, they're likely to have less anxiety, and they're likely to have a tremendous pulse when they get that harmony. When you get into that zone, it's as, it's as good as scoring a try. But of course, drinking is a real problem. You're too young, but I remember being raised on this message. But it was a lie. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> Even a little of it is not good for us, OK? And we in Ireland have a huge problem with the identification with this, because we are raised for generations on believing that this is actually a good thing. But it's not a good thing. You might like it. We might enjoy it. But it's not good for us in itself. One of my predecessors was encouraged by Diageo to come on board and campaign for them. And he said, well, that's interesting. That could be lucrative. And they said, well, we need you to declare that Guinness is a food. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I can't do that. It's not food. Okay. We need to understand what it is. We have an ambivalent sense about drug use. I don't know what the drug culture is here. I'm not going to go into it. and You can, don't have to answer. But the reality is, around this country, we're not really clear about it. You get a rash of terrible deaths, five or six people dying in some place, and they say, ah, yes, they got the bad heroin. Did <laughs> you ever hear that one? Yeah, they got the bad heroin. Like there was a good heroin somewhere else? <laughs> What's that about? Oh, it goes back to the alcohol. You know, we used to say, oh, well, he didn't get drunk. He just got a bad pint. You know, he drank it off a wet glass. Did you ever hear that one? Oh, yeah. No, the reality is we need to look at the management of ourselves in a way that's much more embracing of the truth, of the facts, of the complexities. And debt is one of those things. Ten years ago, we went bust. And now, you know, even the supposed recovery and, you know, we've had ten years of recessionary experience with families and individuals right across the country burdened with enormous debt. If you don't know this, fine, but think about it. You know, why is taxation so high here? It's enormous because we are burdened with enormous debt. And that dress, dress right down to individuals and families, mothers and fathers, and people trying to get a new home. And it's a real stress. There are ways of managing it, ways of considering it. But it isn't simplistic. It is a reality. It's something we have to try and be resilient about. And in many ways, your industry and others like it in Ireland has helped us do that. So where are we then? We're doing all this good stuff. We're eating well. We're sleeping well. We're trying to stay cool on the right side of a pint. We're trying to make sure that we're doing the, the things we need to do. But am I happy now? Am I well now? The next question to ask is, who are you in this? I like to think of each of us as a surfer on a wave, a photon in the wave. We are part of something, and that thing is moving. It's processing. Life is continuing. Health isn't just about skittles or wheatos or diet or bam, 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 all the agenda of being well. It's about continuing even when that doesn't work, or continuing even when it is. A series of actions or steps taken in order to achieve a particular end. The particular end being living well, living happily, overcoming our stress, overcoming our distress, 
overcoming our illness. Life, as John Lennon said, is what happens to us while we're busy making other plans. You see, the plans are good, but no matter what you do, and as you get older, you suddenly find, bang, wow, where did that come out of? Something came from left out of field. Happens to me all the time, I only see out of one eye. So things come out of the blue, I don't know where they came from. <laughs> How did that happen? It was life, folks. I want you to enjoy the experience. It's fantastic. There's a real sense of the joy of work here and creating an atmosphere of joy of work. I had to ask my friend here what these little packets on the chairs here were. Apparently they're prezzies. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Who thought of that? I said, I'd like to keep a chair on the chair. So they said, will you walk around? I said, I'm getting old. I get tired walking around. Can I just sit for a while? They said, well, OK, OK, you can have one chair. <laughs> oh, God, that's fantastic. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> How are you doing? I want every one of you to think about this and say, you know, I'm fantastic. <laughs> now, how many of you have done that today? I'm fantastic. OK. OK, so let's just, I want you to get your right hand up, pat your chest and say, do you know what? I'm fantastic. OK. <laughs> You're fantastic. <laughs> now, if you're finding it difficult to do for yourself, I want you to turn around and do it for your friend. Do it to each other. Do you know what? I think you're fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I think you're fantastic. Do you know you're fantastic? Do you know what you are? You're fantastic. We need to be able to say to each other and communicate with each other positive thoughts. There's a great man called Gilbert, Paul Gilbert, and he's developed a therapy called Compassion Focus Therapy. We come across this. And he's shown that negative thinking, that n destructive thoughts, the defensive postures, these are hardwired and they're adhesive to the tune of nine times more than positive thoughts are, than compassionate thoughts are. We're nine times more likely to say, oh my God, I better get the hell out of here. And these guys are all bastards. Okay. <laughs> We're programmed to do that nine times more. Why is that? We need to start saying yes, processing, and saying yes in lots of ways. One of the yeses I want you to say is this. Yes, mental health matters. Yes, my health matters. Yes, there is no health without mental health. Yes, I would talk about it. Yes, I would take help. Ask yourself today how many yeses you said. You'll find you said nine times more no's than you said yeses. Saying no is what we do. Saying yes takes real talent. But saying yes is how we are resilient and how we get well. I want you to say yes to real help, to real meaningful intervention, to real meaningful sources of recovery that are resilient. And I want you to think about the process of being well. It's not just one skittle or one weedo or one fitness regime or one day at the gym or 10 or 100 or a lifetime. Them. It's actually a process. Keeping learning, connecting, taking notice, being active. Where did these things come from? Well, in the crash happened and they all went to Davos and they said, we need to swingingly get back this money. So the banks have run off with it, but the people, the taxpayers, they're going to have to pay. The corporations, they're going to have to pay. Okay. And some people, for a moment, came back and said, no. One of them, a group called the New Economic Forum. Look them up. Fantastic group. They decided that no argument about the betterment of man would actually convey their sentiment to the people in Davos. However, if they could show that mental health mattered for the economic recovery. Now we've got an argument. It turns out that if we pay all our taxes and swingingly crack down on the population, no one's going to buy a computer or go to the pictures. No one is going to buy a skittle. They'll all be burdened and unable to get back. It makes marketplace sense for mental health. It makes employer sense for mental health. It makes home sense for mental health. So they looked and said, well, we'll study this. 
shame on the psychologists, shame on the doctors, they haven't studied this, we're going to look at what it is to be well. We're going to talk to well people. What do well people do? It's a great study. It turns out well people do this stuff. Well people keep learning. You, keep, you understand this. You're young, you're flexible, you're doing all this stuff. But actually, it's really important to keep learning. Well, people connect with each other. That's why the MK is so near, because you can go over there and you say, well, you know, how are you doing? You know, I have a real problem with this algorithm. Oh, God. <laughs> well, people take notice. I'm looking at this fantastic theater, right? I never knew this. Look at this, fantastic. I want to put on a show here if I can get away with it, OK? <laughs> It's fantastic. I notice how smiley you are, how happy you are, how attentive you are. It's really great. It was a lovely day today. Do you know that? You weren't, I was out and it was great. That's right. I noticed it. Well, people are active. We know that. But well, people do another thing that is one of my favorites. Well, people give. When I was a little kid, giving was about giving to the missions. OK? It's good. Well, people was about giving, giving to Vincent de Paul. It's good. But we didn't have any sense of giving the way I want you to give. All those things, but I want you to do something. I want you to give grace, give ground. I want you to give praise. I want you to give some kind of homage. I want you to give in in a way that you can't imagine. Let me explain. In this country, we say no a lot, OK? I want you, I want you to think of the person you're having your longest, most unresolved dispute with. Somebody you're in conflict with for five years. I want you to think of that person, imagine going, opening the door, greeting them and saying, do you know what? We've been in dispute for five years. And I've been talking bollocks all the time. <laughs> is there any possibility you could do that? Now, if that person is your wife, she'll say, well, of course, I knew that all along. <laughs> But I need you to understand that you walk tall as a resilient creature by giving in, giving ground, giving space, giving mind, being mindful of what's going on. It brings you to the third thing. We've had planning, the details, the things we have to do. We've had processing in the way of continuing to do them, even though it's tough and we get back. But ultimately, the wave has to go somewhere. We are social beings. Ultimately, it's about relating to each other. The living, the working leads to the loving. Without the loving, it really doesn't matter a hang, to be honest with you. The relating is something about making connections between us, feeling sympathy for, and identifying with each other. This is mental health. I know we're confused. You know, am I a photon? Am I in the wave? What am I? But actually, that gap is your opportunity. Mind the gap. Embrace it. It's complex. You can't just fill it with skittles. It has to be something that is about connections. Families could be post-nuclear and yellow. It doesn't matter, OK? The reality is we all got one somewhere. Make the call or, or form your, your connections. Make the connection with somebody but make it with an environmental consciousness. There ain't any point in mental health unless we recognize it's the center of health. And there's no point in health unless we recognize that the whole world's health matters. If the bee goes down, it's all shoot anyway. <laughs> Do you understand? It actually is about us relating in an environment. We need to make this environment prosper. We need to save the bee. And the bee will save us, not just giving us honey, but giving us an environment that's worth living in. Because this is a beautiful planet. And we keep forgetting that. We don't get that on 24-hour news. We don't get, you know, flash, news flash. The world is a beautiful planet. Got to keep you updated. <laughs> Every 50 minutes. Don't get that. But the people, the, the Apollo astronauts, they went to the skies. And they expected to be looking forward, looking at this moon all the time. And then they discovered that all the time they were looking back at that. And they said, wow, that's the most beautiful thing out here. Most of them never, ever forgot it. They could never get over it, the sense of awe they had, 
the wonderment at the recognition of the great opportunity they'd left. The reality is that we need to have compassion for each other, compassion for ourselves. There is no recovery, there is no resilience unless we're compassionate to ourselves. You cannot get well unless you can forgive yourself and forgive each other. And that compassion extends to our fellow man and to our day and to our willingness to deal with the strife and the stress we have. And it depends on advocacy. Each one of you needs to become, hopefully is already because you're here, hopefully joins together with us, meaningfully advocating for health. Because this is the wealth we want to sustain. It is what matters to us. And it's a human right. We have to believe at least in that, if nothing else. Our beliefs are important. And the belief in the value of your life and mine, the value of your mental health and mine, the value of your health, for there is no health without mental health. That belief I want you never to lose. We need to be mindful with that. Non-judgmentally, in the present, sustaining ourselves, knowing that this is worthwhile and matters. We need to have harmony. Old and young, Irish and non-Irish, Googlers and non-Googlers, gay and straight, religious and non-religious, afraid and not afraid. We need to be together in this, in harmony. And it will be wonderful when we are. Thank you for listening to me. So Professor Lucy's going to stay with us just for seven minutes for a quick Q&A. Um, are you happy to, to sit here? Oh, that? yes. Yeah, <laughs> of course. I'm, I'm going to sit on the floor <laughs> gracefully. Here we go. Hi, guys. Um, fab. This is, this is a treat. It is. Yeah, well, it's, I'm, I'm loving it. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so, Professor Lucy, I'll, I'll kick us off and then we'll open up to the audience. Mm. Um, it's a, it's a beautifully put together speech and you have a, a wonderful way on the stage. Uh, you're very funny. It's the first time I think I've ever laughed while somebody's talked about, you know, depression and, and sad things. So thank you for that. Um, I imagine that this is a long piece of work in the making. How has it been for you to be going through all of this? Has it been an easy journey for you to collect all this information? Mm. What's your first name? Amy. Amy, thank you for the question. Um, <laughs> It's a hard question because, of course, it's a very clever question. I think she, Amy was, wasn't telling us the truth when she told us that she couldn't count back in sevens. I think this woman can count back in seconds, no bother. I actually can't, but thank <laughs> you anyway. <laughs> Amy, you're absolutely right. Um, it is, it is uh, trying to be summative. That's what, that's, that's what I've been trying to do. I'm trying to, to come together. But actually, the, the bigger question is, what is it like to do this? What's it like for thousands of uh, people who work in mental health to, to, to do what they do? What's, what's it like for any of us who are experiencing mental health in our families or in our lives or, or at times in our, in our own experience? And the answer is it, it isn't easy, okay? It, it, isn't, it isn't trivial. And the losses can sometimes be terrible. And uh, so what I've tried to do is put together a very personal thing. I could actually unpack each of these with a personal story. I've decided, though, that in many ways, although I could do that, actually it burdens the thing. I've got to get myself out of the room, okay? But each of the slides is actually a family story. Each of the slides is one of my stories. And, and, and you know, I think if, if, we, if, we, if we do that, we just make it confessional and we just make it impossible for people and we distract. So I'm trying to synthesize but also lift it above whatever is the personal issue. But I'll tell you a personal story that might answer your question, which is, um, which is also about change. See, one of the things people say is, plus ça change, nothing changes. But nothing is further from the truth. Lots changes, and it's continuing to change. The question we have to ask ourselves is, where is all this going to go? When I was a young lad, I was born with a cleft palate. Now, a cleft palate is literally your palate is split in two. So then food, food comes down your, your nose. So you can imagine your mother feeding you and all of a sudden the food's coming out. It must have been terrible for her. And then they teach you to speak or you try to speak. And you talk like that with a clip on. I can talk like that all the time because I have a clip on. And uh, then if you're lucky, somebody teaches you how to speak. 
And so if, um, if I remember Miss Morris, who taught me how to speak, and teaching me itsy bitsy spider climbed up the spout. If somebody actually sets up a firing squad and says, you know, come forward, all of you, and anybody who says itsy bitsy spider, I'd probably walk into the gunfire if that was the, if that was the calling. It's so hardwired in me. I've been taught to speak. And so when I was a kid, I went to a lot of operations to fix this. And I was in Temple Street Hospital. And in those days, the children were put in the bed with a blanket over it, like this. Mm, you gotta get out. I'm sorry, I'm six. I need to get out of the bed. Or rather, <laughs> no, no, no. The children had to stay in the bed, blanket tight, okay? And the parents weren't allowed in. Okay, I can still remember seeing through the glass my, my mother and father not getting in. I had an uncle who was mischievous, and he brought me toy cars. Okay? And I used to tear the stitches out of my thing, out of my wounds. So they wrapped up my hands in, this, in, in, in bandage. Now, don't all weep, okay? It's, it's, it's the end of the day. I don't want to be very sad. But the fact is, so now I'm in the bed, and my uncle's toy cars are there, and I want to play cars. Okay? You can't play toy cars if you can't open your hands. Okay? It's a funny thing. The, car, the cars fall off the bed, and then you can't pick them up. In my room, I wrote a book some years ago about, in, about what it's like to be in my room. There are toy cars all over the room. <laughs> I've got lots of toy cars. Toy cars on my desk and toy cars in the window. And uh, it gets better. 20 years, 25 years later, I was a doctor in Temple Street. I worked for there for many, many a long day. There's nobody in bed. The children are up running around. There's Mickey Mouse in the wall. OK, the building's falling down. Now we're going to build a children's hospital. There'll be nobody in bed. There'll be nobody saying you can't come in here to children or families, whatever else. At least ways, I hope not. Because in the meantime, we learned things changed. Okay? And it's a much better experience. So that if there was a personal in these stories, I want you to know that we can learn and we can live and plan and love. And it does get better. That message has to be hope out of this. Lots of things will change. Harnessing that change is really important. The personal, my little story in my cars, you know, okay. But the big message is really fantastic. It actually is happening. This blue planet is changing. And we really need to make sure that, that we harness that change for better mental health. Because we might not. We might start tucking the children up again. And that wouldn't be good. Thank you. Mm. Would anybody in the audience like to answer a question? I have this box to throw at you. Yes, there's one over there. Wonderful. I apologise in advance. <laughs> there we go. I said it would happen. It's fantastic, though. It's great gears. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> the only time I can throw something at work. Um, my question is, so in your talk and even now, you, you've mentioned how times have evolved and how things have progressed. Um, my question is, how or what can we do to help the older generation that we're in contact with? So let's say my, my, my mum, she would have a different experience and varied levels of knowledge when it comes to mental health and accepting that this is actually something that we need to tackle. Yep. What can I do to bring her on board and enlighten her about mental health? Mm. Mm. Well, um, I like your mum. I, 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 I know, I feel I can identify with you. My, my late mum died a few years ago in, in her 80s. She was a, a doctor. And uh, she qualified in the middle of the war. Uh, and there were only two women in her class. So those days they used to call women who qualified lady doctors. They were a different kind of creature, lady doctors. She was a uber femme. <laughs> she couldn't understand this all her life. She was a modern woman. She said, I am going to be a doctor when women aren't let be doctors. It's fantastic, OK? That meant she had to go leave school, go back and do things they didn't teach women, like physics you know, and uh, chemistry. Ladies didn't get taught that in school. She was determined. You'd have thought she would be progressive about mental health. 
She worked in 1947 in Monaghan Asylum. She saw some tough things there. When I decided to be a psychiatrist, I was a general practitioner. Indeed, when my sister decided to be a psychiatrist, my mother was very disappointed. I asked her why. Now, she didn't stop us. No, she wouldn't have done that. But she said, it's just, Jimmy, I'd like you to be working in an area where you see people get better. Think about that. She thought it was going to be in an area where I'd see no joy of recovery. Because to paraphrase, um, to paraphrase Jane Austen, you know, where she says, it's, a, an, it's an axiom that can't be denied that every man in possession of a, of a fortune must be looking for a wife. You know that line? It's absolutely true that every doctor, every nurse in search of a career is looking for somebody who gets better. That's why we do it. Getting better is the nectar that keeps us going, seeing people get better. And she thought I wouldn't see that. I told her, but mom, I see people get better every day. Every day. More than in any other discipline I've worked in, and I've worked in 10. It's fantastic. But that hadn't been her reality. It hadn't been her reality. So I'd say, don't argue with your mother. Don't misunderstand her. Don't actually try to change her mind. Manifest the modern reality with recovery, but understand where she comes from. A time when people perhaps had a much rougher, a much more despairing thing. And then understand that what she doesn't need is an argument. She needs a manifestation of a new reality, a witness. We need to witness recovery. And when we do that, it won't be an argument. It'll be a proof. And it'll be something that they will come on board with. That's what I'd do with your mother. Thank you. We're out of time. Yeah, and I'm very sad about that. But <laughs> it's lovely to have you. Thank you, Amy. Thank, thank you, you very, very much for having me. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well done. <laughs>